seventh judge, Samson, and we were looking last week how truly, I mean, this, this individual, you look at him and he's a man ruled by his emotions and downfall of due to bad decisions and, and uh, he's really a, like a stumbling saint. Uh, he's mighty and at the same time he's weak. He's like a mighty weak man. <laughs> And, uh, and, and we saw it was really last week, if you began to look at that chapter, uh, he, it was a study in God's grace. And with all the mistakes that he made and all the errors that he made and, uh, you, and the sin that he committed, how God's grace abounded over his sin. And uh, really, it all, it all depends on how you look at, at these uh, few chapters on Samson. Uh, if your focus is on the man or your focus is on the God that... that uh, overrules the man <laughs> and what a great God that we have and, and uh, tonight we'll look at this 15th chapter and it gets in some ways more confusing and then I'll show you it's a it's a very curious hidden portrait is in the middle of this thing but um, we come to this 15th chapter remember in the last chapter he had gone down for this particular Philistine woman that pleased him and, and wanted to marry her and went through the whole charade with the riddle and then uh, the woman pressed on him and got him to tell the riddle and then uh, he was angry that she had betrayed him and then he owed these Philistines these 30 changes of garment and so he went down to Ashkelon and he slew 30 men and, and gave the change of garments on, onto the guys that made the bet with him and his anger was kindled and he went away. <laughs> and uh, you, you do rash things in anger. And while he was gone, the last chapter 14, verse 20 says, Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he'd used as his friend. He's unaware of this. He's miles away at his dad's house. And the 15th chapter opens up with, um, but it came to pass within a while after, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. He said, I'll go into my wife into the chamber. And so, you know, now his, his anger settled down and his head's cleared a little bit and and remember, she was kind of good looking, and even though she betrayed me, I mean, after all, she pleased me well with her looks. And men are willing to put up with a lot if a woman looks good. It's a strange thing. It's a, the Bible's trying to help the men to get the, their eyes off the outward and more toward the inner man, which is, should be adorned with a grace and meekness. But, but, but uh, you know, you see the weakness of this guy, and he decides to head on back. And uh, when he gets there, at the end of the first verse, uh, her father would not uh, suffer him to go in. And now the wife that he went away in anger from, now when he returns, has denied him by the father because maybe of his angry abandonment. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what had the father to do that, but maybe he did think, look, this guy came and he left, and I don't know if he's ever coming back, and I don't want my, my daughter hanging around here forever. She you know, she's, has her friends come over and they run up the phone bills and cost a lot in food. I'd like to get her out and get her married off so I don't have to pay for her anymore. And so, so he had uh, given the, the, the girl away to someone else. And um, Samson finds this out for the first time. Well, then the father, of course, uh, says, uh, well, in verse 2, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her, you know, when I saw how angry you were. And so therefore I gave her to thy companion. But I got a deal for you. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her off my hands, I pray thee, instead of her. You know, I just uh, <laughs> kind of what it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not exactly there, but I may be thinking that way. I don't know. And uh, just the old, I, I, what do they call that in, in retailing? Bait and switch, you know? And so, they, they, and so anyways, they're just trying to, to give this off. But, but the, the thing is, and, and Samson is very angry, you're going to see he's going to get real angry and he's going to retaliate over this thing. But, but just going back to what, what caused all this to pass in the first place, well, the truth is Samson wanted this girl. Samson had made all the efforts to get this girl. Samson had even paid her dowry by way of the riddle in a very hard way. And his anger, it was his anger that caused this. And um, you know, one of the things the Lord wants us to learn is anger is foolish and it bears bitter fruit. And it's one of the biggest problems men have. I don't know about women, they don't seem to get angry much, but and I guess they do occasionally. There's a change. I mean, there's a change. The past 50 years, there's been a real change in women. They're, they're more rage testosterone filled than they were going centuries back but and so this is a bizarre you can't make a lot of judgments based on on what's happening nowadays uh, 
uh, what's happening is happening. But the way God made men and women, they really are made differently. And women used to be soft and tender-hearted, and now they're nuts. And I understand, but, the, but it's not entirely their fault. I mean, it, it is this television and uh, and and the drugs and and psychology, and and that's really wrecked them and turned them into uh, stripped-down men. But uh, but. It used to be that men were the angry ones and women were the soft ones, and, and all for centuries it was that way, and, and anger is just foolish. Uh, let's just take a few passages because it's something we need to deal with. You know, so often we're worried about, go to Proverbs chapter 14, so often we as Christians are, are worried about our, our testimony, and sometimes uh, our testimony will wrap it up in perhaps perchance maybe the way we dress, or the, or the way we present ourselves, and the man wears a shirt and a tie, and, and the woman wears a skirt below the knees, and all those types of things, and uh, carries the right type of Bible. But really, the testimony has a lot to do with the Spirit. Really has a lot to do with the Spirit. I mean, I, I would, if I had to take a choice between a, a, some Christian that walks around with a shirt and a tie and the wife that wears a, a, a nice dress and won't wear slacks, you know, and, and she wears a dress below the knees, or, or Christians who are dressed in uh, tank tops and t-shirts, but the Christians had a meek and gentle and quiet spirit. I'll take the spirit over the outer appearance any day of the week. That bits me. And I say, well, I want both. Okay, well, good. And you get both. But I'm telling you, the spirit is really where, where there needs to be some transformation. And uh, Proverbs chapter 14, for example, uh, you know, this anger situation, this, this issue with anger. Proverbs 14, verse 17. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. And then he goes on, and a man of wicked devices is hated. Why? That's a, a, a wicked device is a, is a quick temper. That's a wicked device. I mean, you've got a short fuse that's blowing up all the time. I mean, you, you're soon angry and you've got to let everybody know that you're angry. That's not going to fly anywhere. Now, I understand the Lord's forgiving and I understand you're justified and your sins are paid for and you won't impute it to you and all that. But you're going to have a lot of trouble making friends. Both in and out of the church. An angry spirit is a rough thing to deal with. Uh, he that is soon angry dealeth uh, foolishly. Um, uh, turn, let's say, to Proverbs chapter 19. You know, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Solomon would also write in Ecclesiastes, it resteth in the bosom of fools. I mean, it's just like, it's just right there sleeping right in your heart. It's that angry heart. And, and, uh, and, and Samson had that. He got angry quickly. And, and he's a real picture of a carnal Christian just making a mess of things. Now, thank goodness God's going to overrule and work this thing out so much so that Samson is found in the roll call of faith in Hebrews 11. Hey, that's hope for you and me, folks. Amen. Anyways, in Proverbs chapter 19, uh, uh, verse 11, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger. And it's his glory to pass over a transgression. Why do you put that there? Because that's the cause of the anger. You get mad when someone transgresses against you. That's your anger. That's what rests in the, the bosom of your heart. The unsaved man gets angry when someone messes with him. I don't like that. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus only got angry when someone was harming someone else, right? When someone was trampling on truth Amen. or trampling on another person, then the Lord got angry. We get angry when someone tramples on us. We don't right care if they trample on someone else. That's how politicians get elected because we don't care what they're doing to other people as long as they're okay to me. He's been okay to me. He's trampling on millions of others. Doesn't that trouble you? And, and, and when that transgression happens, it's your glory to pass over and defer your anger. It's, 
someone in a rocking chair goes over your foot, you know, you get angry. You, you got to think, first off, maybe it was an accident. Maybe it wasn't on purpose. A lot of things people do to you are incidental and accidental and not purposeful. So it's, it's kind of our glory to forget about it. And if it is purposeful, maybe it'd be better just to bring it up to the Lord rather than try and fix it yourself. Backing up, let's say, to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Hey, mighty Samson. He was a mighty man. But he had a trigger finger there, man. He had that short, dry fuse. And uh, he that ruleth his spirit is better than the man that takes a city. And Samson's going to take a few cities out in the next few chapters. But he that ruleth his spirit... Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. That's what the Lord would have us to do. I mean, one of the greatest things that we want to do, if possible, with our Christianity, now that we've been born of the Spirit, is let the Spirit bear us about for a while. He's very long-suffering. I'm amazed at, at how long-suffering the Spirit of God is. As a pastor, I hear stories I don't want to hear. I know things that I don't want to know. I sat with a pastor yesterday for a couple hours and talked back and forth and heard 20 years of stories. And uh, I don't want to hear them. It's none of my business. Mm -hmm. But the first time I heard it, but the Holy Spirit wasn't caught by surprise. He'd been through it all. And some of those people that committed those things, I don't know if they're true or not. I don't want to know. Don't care to know. The Holy Spirit knows. Amen. And he's, he's very gentle and forgiving and patient and long-suffering. And that's why he'd like to help us to get some rule over our spirit. Samson made a lot of mistakes because of that, that temper of his. <laughs> Sometimes men have too much testosterone. It kind of sets them off a little bit. But hey, there's something greater than the flesh. There's the spirit of God that can subdue and tame it. <clears throat> Getting back to where we were in, in uh, uh, Judges chapter 15. So, you know, he goes back to get the, the wife and the father says, no, but I, I got a deal for you. I'll give you the younger sister. And uh, here goes Samson getting mad again. And, and Samson says in verse 3, well, uh, Samson said concerning them, now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail, put a firebrand in the midst of two tails. And when he set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing cord with the vineyards and the olives. And here's Samson again, just... Uh, the next few verses, you're just going to get this rapid exchange, this, this terrible cycle of, of various acts of vengeance and retribution and retaliation and this foxtail incident with the firebrands is just, it reminds you of a juvenile prank. Yeah. Something that some, some juvenile who's kind of grown in his body, but he hasn't grown in wisdom and hadn't grown in his spirit, something that they would do, you know? And, and here, this is a man of God. And this is a man of God that, that's a Nazarite. And this is a man of God that God has a mission for. By the way, if you're saved, like spiritually you're a Nazarite in God's eyes. You've been prepared for a mission, given a calling. Even if you haven't been given one of the pastoral offices, you've been given a great and a high calling to represent the Lord Jesus Christ and to present his gospel out there. And here, here's Samson. This thing's just going to escalate. It's going to go round and round and round. And, and here he is taking revenge in a childish manner when he feels that he's been wronged. And here again, where the Lord wants to take the rule on the spirit, to take, don't, don't, don't act right away. Now look, I'm guilty of having done this. You know, the Lord's had to teach me. 
It, it was like this when I was a young Christian. I perceived something was done wrong, and I went to, what, what do they call it, get the ought right, or whatever that thing is. I don't know, if, if it got ought against your brother, blah, 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 and do that kind of thing. And I did that. I blustered and bluffed and howled and made a lot of noise and threw a few Bible verses around. But then after a while, I would, the Lord would, in my prayer closet, kind of like, now you're happy you did it that way? And then, then the next day I had to go right back to the same person. I said, look, brother, I'm sorry, man. I, I shouldn't have done that. And, and after a few times, I said, That's, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't like having to repent and go back and make things right with people. Maybe, maybe rather when this first occurs, maybe I, I better stop and pray first. Or, or at least give myself a day to, to think about the whole situation pray about it, read some Bible, and then see if I want to address it or just pass over what I think or feel might be a transgression. And I'd have to go through this endless cycle. I, I like it better this way. I just have done it both ways. This is better. I like it better like this. But here he goes, taking revenge in a childish manner. I feel I've been wronged. Now, the, the problem is here, he's not dealing with a brother. He's dealing with Philistines. And I want to tell you something, if you do something like that to a lost man, and I did that once at the hospital, it's going to bring a backlash your way <laughs> when I was a young Christian, and I did it to a lost administrator. It, they don't forget those things easily, and they don't have the Spirit of God or the Bible to calm them down. And so now, you know, Samson does this with the Philistines, and the Philistines said, well, who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken a wife and given her to his companion. Then the Philistines came up and watch. They burned her, the girl, and her father with fire. Now what's that all about? Well, first Samson said, hey, at least it didn't bother me. I got away scot-free. And a carnal Christian might think that. But here's what God wants to show you. You do something foolish to a lost person, and that lost person may come back and hurt someone in your family or someone you care for. It's called displaced aggression. Why didn't they take it out on Samson? Samson can fight. Why didn't they take it out on me? Maybe you can use the Bible. But maybe some lesser Christian that doesn't know the Bible, doesn't know the gospel, can't defend themselves, will get beaten up on your account. And uh, this, the enemy couldn't care less about displacing his aggression on some innocent third party, some family member, someone else that's close to you. So again, the Lord wants to show you, you don't live or die to yourself. <laughs> and, and these sins of anger and wrath, they're going to spill over. You might have a child. That child may get it down the road someday for your behavior. Amen. Your parent may get it. Some brother or sister of yours may get it. The enemy's got no problem with taking a shotgun. It's sad. This is a, just a sad series of events that go on here. And um, so how does Samson respond? He hopefully goes to his prayer closet and figures, look what I've done. Look what I've caused now. Verse 7. So Samson said unto them, Although ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that, will I cease? And then he smote them with hip and thigh with a great slaughter and went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Etem. And sadly, here's this, this carnal backsliding Christian here, Samson, rather than pulling back, escalates the battle and justifies himself along the way. Well, you know, I got the Bible right here. I got a verse to prove it. And just, just lives in that stewing anger of his. A mighty man. With, with, with a gift from God. I think pastors need to read this chapter. Maybe this isn't good to teach you. It might not apply. Or evangelists need to read it. But uh, just, just uh, they, they, they just go on. They cannot cease from strife. Uh, you know, in Proverbs, where we were before, in the 20th chapter, it says in verse 3, it says, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife. There's going to be strife in, in, in your life. And, and instead of wanting to get the last word or to gainsay or make sure everybody knows you were right, 
can you just pull back, no matter what anybody else thinks, and just say, Lord, I've had enough. You know, and the other guy was, see, I was right after all. Fine, let him think it. But it's more honorful, if that's such a word, to pull back from the whole thing and just end it. Someone has to take the first step to ending it. Why wouldn't we do that? When, when I was young and I would get into battles, before salvation particularly, and even a little bit after salvation, I just wanted people to know I was right. Samson just had to justify himself. Just this thing ends when everybody knows that I'm right. Now I don't mind if people don't think I'm right. Here, here, let me clue you in on something. You Christian, you believe Jesus is the Christ, you believe the King James Bible, you believe in the young earth creation, <laughs> they're going to think you're nuts anyways. Amen. They already think you're nuts. Amen. They already think you're wrong about most, most stuff. So what if they think you're wrong about this particular situation to one more thing to throw into the knapsack of wrong thinking they have? Big deal. But the carnal, so that was the one in Proverbs. I'm going to give you a couple in the New Testament. So you just pull out Old Testament verses. Okay, go to, go to Philippians chapter 2. I'll try and balance our readings out here. A meek and a quiet and a gentle spirit. What a blessing that is. You know, when I meet someone like that, I'm, I just, I love it. I'm instantly attracted to someone like that. You don't meet a lot of them. Look, look, deep down inside of us, we just want to be right, don't we? We just want to be right, and we just want people to know we're right. I'll tell you two things. One thing, know that Jesus is the Savior. Amen. There's something you can rest in with great comfort. And you know that that great Savior gave you a perfect Bible. That's enough. Amen. And the rest, forget about it. You believe it. It's in your heart. It's of faith. That's wonderful. Yes. Pray for other folks that they may get it too. Yes. Philippians chapter 2. I mean, this striving, this con you got to learn to cease from strife. Mm -hmm. verse, verse 3. Look at Paul. Let me just read 1, 2, and 3 because he's, he gets a rolling start. Look, if, if, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Now he's really, look, he's getting deep here. He's not asking, do you have all this doctrine straight? Can you prove Genesis 6 and Job chapter 1? Look, man, he's, asking, he's saying, look, do you have comfort of love? Do you have any fellowship with the Spirit of God? I've got plenty of fellowship with my Spirit and the few in my Bible study. Yeah, good, that's wonderful. Do you have any bowels of mercy? i just got to make sure this thing's been righted. What about mercy? Then fulfill ye my joy, and be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or, or vain glory. Samson, you don't have to run out and fix that thing. Let, let the Lord handle it. But in lowliness and mind, <laughs> let each esteem other better than themselves. That's a good mindset. You know who gives you that mindset? Well, sh you won't. And either way, your Bible study partner, God will. Amen. I can't tell you. How, I mean, when I read the Bible, the Lord just gives me this impression, and, and, and I just, <laughs> I understand why Paul says I'm the least of all saints. The more I read and the more I get close to the Lord, the more I think I'm just the least of all saints. Amen. That's the lowliness of mind. Well, then I'm in no position to strive with anybody. I'm not looking for fights with anybody. Go to James chapter 3. It 
Samson just couldn't cease from the strife. And, and God wants us to look and, and, and maybe hopefully that we'll learn. Verse 13, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Now look, I think wisdom is good. The Bible says we should get wisdom. And the Bible says we should try and grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, now as this really comes, well then let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. James 3, 13, now 14. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Well, the Lord led me to do that. Don't, don't you know, drop it, man. I've had a lot of saints come to me and talk to me about how the Lord, look, let's not bring the Lord into this, I tell them. Let's leave him out. This is your spirit. This is not God's spirit at work here. They don't like when I say that, but that's the truth. So, so here's this Samson, and, and he just escalates the battle until everybody knows uh, the battle will end when everybody knows I was right. <laughs> I'll be avenged when, when you all know that I've done this. And then, and then he, he, he does this great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt at the top of the rock Etam. Etam, the rock Etam. First off, it's, it's, a, it's an area uh, in the region of Judah, it's to the west, heading toward the Mediterranean Sea. And as you go to the west there, it's on the boundary, the border of Dan and Judah. Dan is not the greatest tribe, they're idolatrous. And, and the rock Etam means the lair of wild beasts. And there's where he's dwelling. Because that beastly nature is pretty much what he's communing with, of glory and strife and envy. And that's where he's resting. That's not exactly the rock you want to be in. <laughs> I'd rather be dwelling in the cleft of the rock that's Jesus Christ, who was meek and lowly in heart. Come learn of me. So, back to where we are. So, so I guess the battle's over. Well, it's not really. Verse 9, it's going to keep going because you're dealing with the enemy. And the enemy won't quit. The enemy won't quit. The enemy won't quit until the Lord stops him. And there's no reason for you and me to imitate him and behave as he does. When are the liberals going to give up? When the Lord puts them down. I just don't mean social political liberals. I mean spiritual liberals. Verse 9, then the Philistines went up and they pitched in Judah and they spread themselves in Lehi. So now they bring an army. It turns out we learn later it's about a thousand men. And here they come and they bring this army forward. And the men of Judah said, why are you come up against us? And they answered, to bind Samson are we come up, to do to him as he hath done to us. <laughs> this battle is going to keep raging here. So then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rocky Tim, where Samson is, and they said to Samson, Hey, knowest thou not that the Philistines are ruler over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. You wrong me, I wrong you back. I return evil for evil. That's the way I am. I'm like John the Baptist. I eat wild locusts and honey, and I'm out there with camels there. I'm a tough guy. It's, it's okay, you know. Now, now, the sad thing that's going on here, and this is really sad, is the men of Judah, this was supposed to be God's tribe to whom would be given the kingship. They were going to be the defenders of Israel. And here they are, and here comes an enemy for one of their brethren, and instead of rallying around the brother, even though he made a few mistakes, they're willing to bind him and turn him over to the enemy. And they're befriending the enemies of God. And here's a sad thing you're going to learn. It's sad to see Christians cower 
in the face of opposition, befriend the wrong side, and then fight on the wrong side of an issue. And that'll happen. And that, that's sad. This is, this is a sad chapter. These chapters are sad. I'm going to show you something beautiful about them in a few minutes because you got to look, but God is going to show some beauty in here. Reminds me of that picture. There's this picture. It's either a, a young maid or an old witch. You know, you ever seen that picture? It's a, 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 it was first just a pencil drawing, and then today there was one online. It's actually color and everything. And you look one way, and there's the young maid. You look the other way, and there's an old witch. And you're going to see in this picture of this old witchery that's going on of these carnal Christians, there's a beautiful work of God going on here. It's a portrait of the gospel and Christ in here, and I'll show you in a few minutes. But it uh, would <laughs> be real easy just to see the witch in this picture. And to see all the ugliness and the sin going on here. And there's a lot of it. But thankfully, God's grace is going to abound over it all. And Samson ends up in Hebrews 11. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I've met a few Samsons. I've been one of them. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Folks, you're going to see at the judgment seat of Christ who gets the glory. And yet he's still going to reward us. And then he's worthy of even more glory. Right, brother? You're going to get rewarded. You. You. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> and, and, and you know you know what the glory is? It's going to be the Lord. Amen. And you'll be thanking him. And I'll get rewarded. I'll be thanking him. What a deal. But here we see now the brethren going on the wrong side. You know why? Because they were in sin. Chapter 13, verse 1. The children of evil, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Yeah. And you know what sin does? Sin makes cowards of men. Amen. That's what it does. Amen. Proverbs chapter 28 tells us that the wicked flee when no man pursueth. Sin will make a coward of you. You know where it'll make a coward? In your testimony. You live in sin. You don't particularly want to tell anybody that you're a child of God. I mean, even a lost man knows there's something about the true God and his true children. And if you're living in sin, how can you say you're a child of God? Hypocrite. They'll know. They're, they'll be quick to pull that word out on you. And here these Judeans, who should have been the strength of God's nation, are cowering under the Philistines because of the sin they're living in. Amen. Isaiah chapter 33, uh, verse 14, beautiful verse. And, and it uh, just, it's beautiful in, in the fact that it's so truthful. And, and it says, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. And here they are afraid. Now, the, the funny thing is, there's 3,000 Judeans and there's 1,000 Philistines. They had them outnumbered three to one and they were afraid. And so, verse 11, the 3,000 men go up to Samson he explains, well, they wronged me. That's why I did it. In verse 12, and they said unto him, well, look, we're come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. I beg your pardon? You're going to aid and abet the enemy? Sin will make you do strange things. You'll find Christians, we go to a taste of buffalo. We're out there at the Italian festival. We're preaching. We're passing out tracts. We're surrounded by Philistines, you know? Philistines that need the gospel. We're trying to give them the gospel. And I got Judean brethren coming up to me. What are, you, what are you judging these people for? This is no way to treat them. And the Philistines just love it. And here I got born again Christians. Wanting to bind me. Yeah, yeah, he's down there, officer. He's down there preaching. He's bothering all the people there. I mean, you, are you kidding me? Amen. 
Yeah, we're here to bind you. Verse 12, Samson said unto them, Well, look, at least swear unto me you will not fall upon me yourselves. I mean, make the handcuffs loose. And they spake them, No, no, we will just bind thee fast uh, and then deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And, and I mean, just a backslidden Christian like that, a hypocrite, sometimes worse than your proclaimed enemy. And, and they'll ruin you when the enemy can't. That's why I thank God that he does have different churches for us to go to. And you can find some like-minded brethren that will stick together with you. Because you want to be a servant of the Lord in one of these modern, purpose-driven, carnal churches, <laughs> you're going to be in a lot of trouble because they'll turn on you. And the, the chapter closes here with uh, Samson. And, uh, and when he came to Lehi, and he was bound by his brethren, the Philistines shouted against him. Hey, we got him. We got him beat. Their, their shout is a little premature. You don't boast uh, before you put the harness on. I mean, you better. And because when they shouted against him, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire. And his bands loosed from off his hands, and he found a new jawbone of an ass, and he put forth his hand, and he took it, and he slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand, and he called the place Ramoth Lehi. And uh, again, those Philistines, uh, boy, now we had the help of the brethren and, and they're with us. And, and now we've got, of course, we're against Samson, the man of God. And, and now we've got other Christians against Samson, the man of God. And, and, and we've got a huge majority here against the man of God. Unfortunately, the man of God had one other person with him. <laughs> and and uh, one plus God makes a majority. And. <laughs> And their shout of victory turned into a shriek of desperation followed by the silence of death. And, and this a jawbone of an ass against armed soldiers. I mean, a very weak instrument is mighty in the hands of God. Amen. And, and the weapon doesn't matter all that much. The strength doesn't lie in the weapon. It's in the arm of the one holding it who's God. Because my strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. And the Lord steps up to the battle here. And uh, uh, spiritually, I mean, the portrait here slays a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. You know what that's a picture of? Two, two passages, Job 11.12 and Hosea 6.5. Job 11.12 and then Hosea 6.5. The jawbone of an ass. For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. And, and the way that we're made in our first birth is like a wild ass. And the jawbone of an ass in Hosea chapter 6, verse 5, the Spirit of God coming upon a man and taking his jawbone and using that, opening it, and making it speak the words he wants. Hosea 6, 5, Therefore God says, Have I used them? the enemies of God, by the prophets. I've slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. And, and it's preaching. It's a picture of just a man opening his mouth and preaching. That's what it's a portrait of. And uh, Samson, in his excited quote there of, uh, 
He says, uh, Samson says, with the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. And there he is alone, just but with the Spirit of God, and using that preaching, if you will, that battle to win. And it's like a portrait of, Jesus said in, in Isaiah 63, 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me for I will tread them down. That's the Lord in mine anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is in mine heart. And it's a picture of the Lord alone one day when he comes back and with the breath of his mouth and the word that he speaks takes the armies of the Philistines and lays them heaps upon heaps in Armageddon. Doctrinally, that's a picture of But spiritually, it's us folks. I mean, he called the place Ramoth Lehi. Ramoth, the word Ramoth, means the high place. And Lehi means the jawbone. And Ramoth Lehi is the high place of the jawbone. It's the picture of you and me doing what God has called us to do. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul made it plain and clear. I'm not here to baptize people. I'm not here to preach words of wisdom to people. Uh, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Take, a, take an ass, the jawbone of an ass, and preach plain. Amen. By the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And, and if we would just stand there with the Spirit of God on us and open our mouths... Why? Look, the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Amen. They say, that's awfully weak. That's not that powerful. That won't work. It's a picture of it working right there. Amen. The Philistines are no different today. And the Spirit of God is no weaker than He was back then. Amen. He's just looking for someone that will stand. He said, we preach Christ crucified. The Jews, it may be a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it may be foolishness. But to them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, it is Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. And it does bring glory to our Savior. Preaching, this is called Ramoth Lehi, the high place of the jawbone. This is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm sick and tired of hobby horses in the church. I'm fed up with the hobby horses. And I love dispensational truth and I love all that stuff and I love all those studies about the Antichrist and all that. I don't even care for it. But I mean, I know some people do. Look, look, there's one main, and then when the standards and living this way and your TV and your Christmas, look, there's one thing God wants out of you. You got one shot while you're alive is to open that ass's jawbone of yours and to preach Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how people get saved. Amen. They're not going to get saved by your lifestyle. Your lifestyle isn't as good as Jesus Christ and he couldn't save them with his lifestyle. Amen. He preached. And Lord trying to teach us something here and we miss it. And I understand people with NIVs and living translations, not they're clueless. Amen. But when people with a King James Bible get off the main thing, something's wrong. Yeah. Amen. And not around here. And I've been nice for too long, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I put up with thorns around here. I'm not putting up with them anymore. Amen. And if I find people drifting, I'm going to boot them out. Amen. I've had it. We need to be on one thing and one thing. Oh, the time is short. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. There are, Jesus died for sinners, Lord. not for self-righteous, pharisaical saints. Amen. And we need to be about the preaching. Amen. It's a high calling. We've been trusted with the oracles of God, which are about the Son of God. They're not about our lifestyles. 
Now, I'm not encouraging you to go out and live like the devil. But don't get so focused on yourself in a spiritual mirror and everyone else that you're missing what God would have us to do. And we need to pray for souls and we need to reach out to these souls. Now, going back to where we are, I mean, the high place of the jawbone, it's a high calling to be entrusted with this gospel. Now, you heard the prayers tonight. Our radio program, we want to make sure we're getting the gospel out at all times. I could drift and have all kinds of exciting programs on about all kinds of current events. No, no. Got one hour. I want to make sure the gospel is being preached and people are hearing how to get saved. And we need to be thinking on these things when we're out there. We need to be nice to people. Hey, did you read your Bible today? I read a great verse in my Bible. Here's a Bible booklet for you. And sowing seed and then praying about the seed. And taking these asses jaw bones and making sure we're out there Ramoth Lehi with a high calling. And the chapter closes, and, and uh, after this battle, verse 18, he was sore of thirst, and he called on the Lord. And uh, you'll be thirsty after a battle. Amen. And it's good to pray after a battle. This is one of the two times in all these chapters that Samson prays. And he, and he calls on the Lord, and he says, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. Now shall I die for thirst? And fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And the answer is no. The Lord has rivers of living water. You'll never dry up on the vine of Jesus Christ. He's the true vine. And if, you don't, if, you're, if you're still thirsty, it's, you have not because you asked not. And so Samson, you know, he prays and God answers this prayer related to service. Of course, verse 19, God clave a hollow place that was in the jaw and there came water there out. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he revived. Wherefore, he called the name of an Enhak Kore, which is in Lehi to this day. Enhak means the fountain of and Kore is a crier. That's a cry aloud, spare not. The fountain of the crier. If you're willing to preach, you'll never go dry from God's standpoint. He will fill you and fill you and repeatedly fill you. And it's, it's like a spiritual high. Yes, he will. Amen. To do the work that pleases the Father, the Father will feed you the meat and the drink that you need. Hey. <laughs> and it's in Lehi to this day. And it's, it's, and it's here to this day for us. Uh, I mean, to this very day, Lehi, again, means the jawbone. It's right here to this day. It's, it's ready right now. God will fill anyone's mouth with water and the Spirit. Who will go for us? Is the question he asks. The, the, the harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Christians sitting on the sidelines, sitting on benches, sitting on pews, not doing anything. How can this gospel be hid? It's too good. It's good news. You have good news for people. You have the cure for spiritual cancer and death. Jesus Christ. And, and, and it's offered for free. It's a free gift to, to whosoever. It's beautiful. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. And thankfully, you know, the Lord used him for a while. But, but the, the gospel, Jesus said, um, search the scriptures in them. You think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. He said, look, Father, in the volume of the book, it's written of me, he says in Hebrews. And this is like you look at this chapter and you see Samson escalating and striving and fighting and and then, and then after a victory, he prays, you know, for himself, and that's good. It's one of the two times he prayed. You know, I mean, he was raised by praying parents. It's amazing. We don't see him praying before. Had he prayed before, he probably would have saved himself from a lot of heartache in his life. Amen. And, and it's just kind of like that ugly witch picture. But then you start looking at it, and you begin to see... The gospel is in here. First thing, what do we see? Well, like I showed you back in 13, verse 1, 
the Jews were in bondage. Israel was in bondage. Just like the nation was at the time the deliverer, Jesus Christ, came. At the time that the Lord Jesus Christ came in Luke chapter 2, it says in those days there was a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And of course, the, the gover Cyrenius was governor in Syria. And here's Joseph, a Judean, in bonds of the house of David, of the lineage of David, being taxed because Israel was in bondage to a nation, just like this Israel was in bondage to the Philistines. And Israel and all people are in bondage to sin. And they're overlorded and overruled by sin. And because of that, we see in these chapters here that at the time this is all going on, they had very poor vision. Their vision was so poor that they ran to Samson in the 15th chapter and they said, uh, let me find the verse, uh, uh, verse 11. And they, they run to Samson with the 3,000 men, and they say to him, Hey, knowest thou not that the Philistines are the rulers over us? And in their, in their bondage to sin, their vision is so blind that they think they're ruled by the Philistines. This is God's people. God's the ruler. And they're, letting, they're acting like Philistines are the ruler. And when you're in sin, you're so blinded, you don't know who rules you. Amen. You're in complete confusion. And, and even at the time when Jesus Christ came, there was the same type of confusion going on in the nation at that time. Uh, in the 11th chapter, the Pharisees gathered the chief priests of council, and they said in John eleven forty-seven, 47, What should we do? This man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, uh, men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away our place in our nation. And they were so blind, they forgot that God was their ruler. You get bad, blurry vision when you're under the effects of sin. Later on, when uh, Jesus was presented, Pilate said, Behold the man. Be behold your king. Shall I crucify your king? We, we have uh, no king but Caesar. I mean, completely blinded to the fact that God was their king. And then they're so blinded by their condition that when Samson comes along, given by God to be their deliverer, they see him as the enemy. They see the deliverer as the enemy and the enemy as the ruler. They're upside down and backwards in their thinking. And of course, the Jews were the same time, this is the same mindset when Jesus showed up. Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 19 and he said, I'll tell you a parable about a man he says that went to get the kingdom of God, a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he said to his servants, here are 10 pounds, occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. We don't want this one as our enemy. And then when he explains it later on, he ends the, the explanation in verse 27. He says, but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring them hither. And, and here's the deliverer, Jesus Christ, and they see him as the enemy. The, the bondage of sin and the burden of sin so blinds us that we see the enemies as our friends and our good rulers. And we vote for people we shouldn't and follow people we shouldn't. And we see the real deliverer as the enemy. And that's what they were doing here with Samson. Amen. And then in their foolishness, yeah. Judah turns around and binds the Savior that God gave them and turns him over to the enemy. Yeah. Yeah. Just like in Matthew chapter 27, and when the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death, and they bound him, and they led him away, and delivered him to Pontius Pilate. Amen. Yes, they did. Mm. And, then, and then the Lord, and all through this chapter, he portrays this escalating cycle that goes on, which is just kind of laughable from his standpoint, of the enemy's helplessness against the man that he sends. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, you just go back and you consider it's like it's it's like it's this a solution failure problem. The enemy says, "Okay, how are we going to beat this Samson? What are we going to do to beat this guy? I got a plan. First thing we'll do is uh, he's got that riddle. So let's go after his wife and threaten to burn them and burn the wife and burn the father. And, and that way we'll get the answer to the riddle. So see, see, we got this thing worked out. Well, well, the very solution they worked out turned out to be a failure and a problem for them because once they did it, then Samson killed 30 of their best men. So then they said, okay, wait a second. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make sure she's taken away from him. We'll talk the father into giving her to someone else. That'll work. Well, then that solution turns right around because when Samson found out about it, what? They did what? I'll take the foxtails and I'll burn their crops. So, okay. Oh, really? He did that? Well, I'll tell you what. I, I will solve that. We'll kill, we'll kill the, the woman and the father. Yeah. Samson says, you kill the woman and the father. Then he goes down and he has another great slaughter at the rocky tomb. They say, okay, well, then what we need to do is we need to capture him. Well, we can't do it alone. We need their help. So they get their help and they get him captured. And then he comes out and he kills a thousand with the job of an ass. Yeah. And, and it's just this insanity how the heathen sitteth in the heavens laughs. Say, go ahead, come up with your next solution. It'll be a greater source of failure. Go ahead, try again. Anything you want to come up against, my man, will never work. Amen. You can't beat my gospel. You can't beat my power. Yeah. And it'll, it, this will roll right on into the 16th chapter. <laughs> He that sits in the heavens laugh. I got a new gospel. I got new ways of making people right. I got new ways of doing this. I got some new thing I come up with, a new religion. New, new. Go ahead, try it. Amen. It'll redound to your own failure and more destruction. You can do nothing against the truth, God says. Amen. And, then, and then, of course, the one other thing we learn that's like the gospel that's hidden in here, the truth about that gospel is... Nothing can be done in service of the gospel apart from the Spirit of God. Amen. It was when the Spirit of the Lord came on him in verse 14. The Spirit of the Lord is required for battle. The Lord Jesus Christ told those men in the upper room in John 15, I am the true vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. And apart from the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Jesus Christ, they couldn't even get ready for the battle. And not only was the Spirit required to enter the battle, the Spirit was required after the battle. In verse 19, he prayed again, and the Lord gave him the Spirit a second time. Everything you and I do must be done in and through and by the Spirit of God. Amen. If it's done in our flesh, come on, we know that's worthless. Amen. But even when it's done in our own spirit, Amen. we make a mess of things. Right. Our spirit naturally goes back to that angry one we were talking about at the beginning of the hour. That envious, vainglorious, strifeful one. Yep. And so you see the beauty I've, I've heard this, this chapter like an ugly witch just hanging over. What's the matter with this? And you look at it from here and you see the beauty of God's gospel and his grace all through here is in the midst of bondage and in the midst of poor vision and in the midst of foolishness and in the midst of a helpless enemy, you see the spirit of God preparing and winning and wooing and winning and providing. Is it good? Amen. Is God good? Yes, he is. All the time. All the time. Yes, the hidden gospel found in the life of Samson. You know how good it is? He ends up in Hebrews 11. That's, that's the chapter of faith. Well, he didn't have much faith. Well, I, I mean, uh, John says this. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Why don't we sing number 413? It's good to be saved. Before